first kick pragmatism off by starting from Alexander Bain's definition of belief as a rule or habit of action. Starting from that definition, Peirce argued that the function of inquiry is not to represent reality, but rather to enable us to act more effectively. This means getting rid of the copy theory of knowledge, which had dominated philosophy since the time of Descartes, and especially of the idea of intuitive self-knowledge, knowledge unmediated by signs. As one of the first philosophers to say that the ability to use signs is essential to thought, Peirce was a prophet of what Gustav Bergmann called the linguistic turn in philosophy. Like 19th century idealists such as T.H. Green and Josiah Royce, Peirce was anti-foundationalist, coherentist, and holist in his view of the nature of inquiry. But he did not, as most of Hegel's Anglophone followers did, think of God as an all-inclusive, atemporal experience which is identical with reality. Rather, as a good Darwinian, Peirce thought of the universe as evolving. His god was a finite deity who is somehow identical with an evolutionary process which Peirce called the growth of thinking. Sorry, the growth of thirdness. This quaint term signifies the gradual linking of everything up with everything else through triadic relationships. Rather strangely and without much in the way of argument, Peirce took all triadic relationships to be sign relations and vice versa. His philosophy of language was intertwined with a quasi-idealistic metaphysics. James and Dewey both admired Peirce and shared his sense that philosophy must come to terms with Darwin, but they sensibly paid little attention to his metaphysics of thirdness. Instead, they focused on the profound anti-Cartesian implications of Peirce's development of Bain's initial anti-representationalist insight. They developed a non-representationalist theory of belief acquisition and testing, which culminates in James's claim that, I quote, the true is only the expedient in our way of thinking, close quote. James and Dewey both wanted to reconcile philosophy with Darwin by making human beings' pursuit of the true and the good continuous with the activities of the lower animals, making cultural evolution continuous with biological evolution. All three of the founding pragmatists combined a naturalistic Darwinian view of human beings with a distrust of the problems which philosophy had inherited from Descartes, Hume, and Kant. All three hoped also to save moral and religious ideals from empiricist or positivist skepticism. It's important, however, not to be blinded by these similarities and by the fact that the three men are always treated as members of a single movement to the fact that they had very different philosophical concerns. It is probably only the chauvinistic need to have a distinctively American philosophy which has engendered the idea of a pragmatic movement. It's best, I think, to view these three men simply as three interesting philosophers who happen to be American and had a perceptible influence on each other's work, but no more closely allied with one another than, for example, Brentano, Husserl, and Russell. Although each of the three knew and respected the other two, the motives that drove them to philosophy were very different. Peirce thought of himself as a disciple of Kant, improving on Kant's doctrine of categories and his conception of logic. A practicing mathematician and laboratory scientist, Peirce was more interested in these areas of culture than were James and Dewey. James took neither Kant nor Hegel very seriously, but was far more interested in religion than either Peirce or Dewey. Dewey, deeply influenced by Hegel, was fiercely anti-Kantian. Education and politics, rather than science or religion, were at the center of his thought. Peirce was a brilliant, cryptic, and prolific polymath whose writings are very difficult to piece together into a coherent system. Peirce protested James's appropriation of his ideas for complex reasons having to do with his obscure and idiosyncratic metaphysics, and in particular with his doctrine of scotistic realism, the doctrine of the reality of universals, 
which were sometimes considered as triadic relations, sometimes as sign relationships, sometimes as potentialities, and sometimes as dispositions. Peirce was more sympathetic to idealism than James and found James's version of pragmatism simplistic and reductionist. James himself, however, thought of pragmatism as a way of avoiding reductionism of all kinds and as a council of tolerance. Although he viewed many metaphysical and theological disputes as, at best, exhibitions of the diversity of human temperament, James hoped to construct an alternative to the anti-religious, science-worshipping positivism of his day. He approvingly cited Giovanni Papini's description of pragmatism as, I quote, like a corridor in a hotel. Innumerable chambers open out of it. In one you may find a man writing an atheistic volume. In the next, someone on his knees praying for faith. In a third, a chemist investigating a body's properties. They all own the corridor and all must pass through it." Close quote. James's point was that attention to the implications of beliefs for practice offered the only way to communicate across divisions between temperaments, academic disciplines, and philosophical schools. In particular, such attention offered the only way to mediate between the claims of religion and those of science. Dewey, in his early period, tried to bring Hegel together with evangelical Christianity. Although reference to Christianity almost disappear, references to Christianity almost disappear from his writings around 1900, in a 1903 essay on Emerson, he still looked forward to the development of what he called, quote, a philosophy which religion has no call to chide and which knows its friendship with science and with art, close quote. The anti-positivist strain in classical pragmatism was at least as strong as its anti-metaphysical strain. Dewey urged that we make no sharp distinction between moral deliberation and proposals for change in socio-political institutions or in education. He saw changes in individual attitudes, in public policies, and in strategies of acculturation as three interlinked aspects of the gradual development of freer and more democratic communities and of the better sort of human being who would be developed within such communities. All of Dewey's books are permeated by the typically 19th century conviction that human history is the story of expanding human freedom and by the hope of substituting a less professionalized, more politically oriented conception of the philosopher's task for the platonic conception of the philosopher as spectator of time and eternity. He thought that Kant, especially in his moral philosophy, had preserved that platonic conception. In his 1920 book, Reconstruction in Philosophy, Dewey wrote, quote, under disguise of dealing with ultimate reality, philosophy has been occupied with the precious values embedded in social traditions, has sprung from a clash of social ends and from a conflict of inherited institutions with incompatible contemporary tendencies, close quote. For him, the task of future philosophy was not to achieve new solutions to traditional problems, but to clarify, I quote, men's ideas as to the social and moral strifes of their day. This historicist conception of philosophy, which developed out of Hegel's and resembled Marx's, has made Dewey less popular among analytic philosophers than either Peirce or James. Dewey's intense concern with parochially American political and social issues has also served to limit interest in his work. Yet, precisely because of his self-conscious historicism, Dewey was, I shall be arguing in these lectures, the classical pragmatist whose work may have the greatest utility in the long run. Whether or not Dewey is the most useful of the three classical pragmatists first seems to me the least useful. Although he wrote more than either of the other two, and was perhaps the most professional of the three, his thought lacked focus and direction. Contemporary philosophers who call themselves pragmatists typically take over only one thing from Peirce, his substitution of talk of signs for talk of experience. Instead of signs, however, they speak of language, which means excluding what Peirce called icons and indices from the realm of signs, and including only what Peirce called symbols. It seems safe to say that if Peirce had never lived, it would have made no great difference to the history of philosophy, 
for Frege would have made the linguistic turn single-handedly. Some contemporary philosophers, such as Hilary Putnam and Jürgen Habermas, give Peirce an importance that I would not give him. That's because these two philosophers take over Peirce's definition of truth as that to which opinion is fated to converge at the end of inquiry, and his definition of reality as what is believed to exist at that convergence point. I don't find that notion of convergence clear or helpful for reasons that I'll be giving tomorrow. My main reason for thinking Peirce relatively unimportant, however, is that he does not become engaged in the way in which James and Dewey did become engaged with the problem which dominated Kant's thought and which was at the center of 19th century thought in every Western country, the problem of how to reconcile science and religion, how to be faithful both to Newton and Darwin and to the spirit of Christ. That problem is the paradigm of the sort of conflict between old ways of speaking and new cultural developments, which Dewey took it to be the philosopher's task to resolve. The need to reconcile science and religion was all important for Dewey during his first 30 years and for James throughout his life. By contrast, Chris's discussion of this issue consists of... Sorry. consists of rather banal remarks, remarks which were the commonplaces of 19th century thought. We find per saying, for example, that the apparent clash between these two areas of culture is the result, quote, of the unphilosophical narrowness of those who guard the mysteries of worship. Peirce rejects the suggestion that, quote, he is to be prevented from joining in that common joy at the revelation of enlightened principles of religion which we celebrate at Christmas, Christmas and Easter, because I think that certain scientific, logical, and metaphysical ideas which have been mixed up with these principles are untenable. He says that the only distinctive thing about Christianity is the idea that love is the only law, and that Christianity's ideal is, quote, that the whole world shall be united in the bond of a common love of God accomplished by each man's loving his neighbor, close quotes. This is a pretty standard 19th century Anglophone way of following up on Kant's religion within the limits of reason alone. It amounts to saying that you can have Christian ethics without Christian theology, and therefore without interfering with Newtonian cosmology or with Darwinian accounts of human origins. This easy compromise struck James and Dewey as it struck Nietzsche as too easy. That's because these two men took religion a lot more seriously than Peirce ever did. Peirce was raised an Episcopalian, claimed that it was the only religion for a gentleman, and experienced, as far as we know, no great spiritual crises which expressed themselves in religious terms. James, however, was raised by his eccentric father on a kind of idiosyncratic blend of Swedenborg and Emerson. Though he and his siblings had the good sense not to take their father's idiosyncratic theological ideas with any great seriousness, William took his father's religious experiences very seriously indeed. He suffered the same sort of spiritual crises as had afflicted Henry James Sr., and was never sure whether to describe them in psychological or in religious language. Dewey was the only one of the three classical pragmatists to have had a really strenuous religious upbringing. Dewey was the only one to have encountered religion, so to speak, in its full fury. He was also the only one who ever swallowed it full strength. His mother continually asked Dewey, are you right with Jesus? And his biographers agree that belated resentment at his mother's meddling piety was central to the formation of Dewey's mature thought. Despite the fact that James never had to cast off an orthodoxy imposed in his youth, the need to bring his father into the same intellectual universe as that inhabited by his scientifically oriented friends, such as Peirce and Chauncey Wright, was very important in shaping his thought. I suspect that we owe the pragmatist theory of truth to this need. For the underlying motive of that theory is to give us a way to reconcile science and religion by viewing them not as two competing ways of representing reality, but rather as two non-competing ways of producing happiness. I take the anti-representationalist view of thought and language to have been motivated, in James's case, 
by the realization that the need for choice between competing representations can be replaced by tolerance for a plurality of non-competing descriptions, descriptions which serve different purposes and which are to be evaluated by reference to their utility in fulfilling these purposes rather than by their fit with the objects being described. If James's watchword was tolerance, then Dewey's was, as I've said, anti-authoritarianism. Dewey's revulsion from the sense of sin which his religious upbringing had produced led him to campaign throughout his life against the view that human beings need to measure themselves against something non-human. As I'll be saying in more detail later, Dewey used the term democracy to mean something like what Habermas means by the term communicative reason. For him, this word sums up the idea that human beings should regulate their actions and beliefs by the need to join with other human beings in cooperative projects rather than by the need to stand in the correct relation to something non-human. This is why Dewey grabbed hold of James's pragmatic theory of truth. Although James will always be the most sympathetic and the most readable of the three classical pragmatists, Dewey was, I think, the most imaginative. This is because he was the most historically minded, the one who learned from Hegel how to tell great sweeping stories about the relation of the human present to the human past. Dewey's stories are always stories about progress from the need of human communities to rely on a non-human power to their, re to their realization that all they need is faith in themselves. They are always stories about the substitution of fraternity for authority. His stories about history <coughs> As, the story, of increasing, as incre the story of increasing freedom, our stories about how we lost our sense of sin and also our hope of another world and gradually acquired the ability to find the same spiritual significance in cooperation between finite mortals that our ancestors had found in their relation to an immortal being. His way of clarifying what he called men's ideas as to the social and moral strifes of their own day was to ask his contemporaries to consider the possibility that weekday cooperation in building democratic communities could provide everything higher, everything which had once been reserved for weekends. 